Okay. So as Vikram said, I'm a co-founder, VP of Core Technology here at Butterfly Network. Um, since we are now, uh, as of about a month ago, a public company, I have to say some things like we're, there may or may not be some forward-looking statements and that, you know, refer to our SEC filings if you want any more information on, on the core business. Um, but really wanted to talk to you about the Butterfly IQ. So that is uh, this device right here. It's a an entire ultrasound machine that can fit into your pocket. And when you plug it into your phone, you get the capability to image pretty much anywhere in the entire body. And this is really the, the first kind of device of its kind. And it's the reason we are able to build this is we actually put an ultrasound machine on a semiconductor chip so that we can make it very affordable. It costs about $2,000. So um, about an order of magnitude more affordable than uh, the alternative solutions out there. And the reason why this is, is very important uh, to the world that I believe is uh, about two thirds of diagnostic dilemmas can actually be addressed through a simple kind of imaging like you can with an ultrasound machine. Uh, but at the same time, about two thirds of the world has no access to any kind of medical imaging whatsoever. And this has some pretty severe consequences to the world. So just a few examples um, about every 90 seconds, uh, a woman in the developing world dies during childbirth. And it's for reasons that we've known for a long time how to prevent and how to address these issues. Uh, the problem is uh, they're very difficult to intervene when you're not in a hospital. And when you're in these parts of the world, the nearest hospital might be two days away on foot. And so it's, it's, it's critical that you're able to understand who needs to, uh, to actually go into the hospital to survive and, and who doesn't. And all you need is, is one piece of information. You just need that image to see the child and you would know what to do and you could prevent all of this. Uh, another statistic about uh, 2 million children die each year from childhood pneumonia. It's uh, one of the biggest killers of children in the world. And this is another, another one of those things that can be solved very simply with imaging, because if you could see the fluid in the lungs, you would know uh, that you would need to change the course of treatment for this, uh, for this child, that it's, it's not a more benign illness. It's something serious that may eventually kill them. And so uh, often the difference between life and death is just a single image. And most of the world doesn't have access to the technology that would get them that image. So I started my career at MIT working on a novel radio telescope concept. And the idea was to leverage modern computing to fundamentally change how we can build telescopes so that we can see uh, the universe in a way that we hadn't been able to, to before. And so this is uh, the Omniscope work that happened out of Max Tegmark's lab at MIT. And we were uh, basically a novel algorithm to, to build very large telescopes uh, efficiently using existing computer hardware. About that time, I met uh, Dr. Jonathan Rothberg, who is actually a, a friend of, of Max's. And Jonathan is a scientist and entrepreneur who had uh, recently revolutionized gene sequencing by taking that whole gene sequencing process from a giant laboratory that would fill a room to a laboratory that fits on a semiconductor chip. And so now you could sequence an entire genome uh, for less than $1,000 on a machine about the size of a desktop printer. So it was a huge change in, in how we can do genomics. And Jonathan's, the, the, the backstory is that Jonathan's daughter has a rare condition that requires frequent use of ultrasound imaging to monitor growth centers on her kidney. And that meant frequent trips to, to fancy hospitals to, uh, that were often you know, a long drive away. And we had to ask ourselves, why was this technology uh, isolated to these key technology centers? Why wasn't it more distributed? It had been around for almost half a century. And if you look at it, the reason is that the way that we fundamentally build an ultrasound machine hasn't changed a whole lot in the last 50 years. So it went from large machines on wheels to uh, more powerful large machines on wheels. And if you look what happened in other industries, uh, take computing, for example, we have supercomputers that used to fill a room, uh, now fit in our pocket. Uh, we used to have cameras that would run on film and large lenses, and now they're also on our phone in our pockets. So what happened with ultrasound? So that was that what really became our mission is to take this ultrasound machine and to do to ultrasound uh, what had already happened in microprocessors, what had already happened in photography, 
bring it onto a semiconductor platform so that you could actually lower the cost dramatically and dramatically increase the accessibility of this, uh, of this technology. And we succeeded in doing that. So this is uh, what we call the world's first complete ultrasound system on a chip. It was really the first commercially available integration between uh, semiconductor based transducers and the semiconductor electronics into a full package uh, to make a $2,000 ultrasound imaging machine. And uh, you know, the advantages of this are, are pretty easy to see because you can literally print you know, dozens of ultrasound machines on a wafer using the same types of technology that uh, go into making electronics for cell phones. So it completely changes the cost equation, equations, completely changes the economics and scalability. Uh, so, so now we can use this to really deliver uh, medical imaging capabilities all around the world to people that would otherwise not have it. And it's not just a cheaper ultrasound machine. Uh, by integrating everything on a chip, we could actually make a very powerful state-of-the-art imaging system. And uh, it's also one of really the only one that can span the, a whole range of anatomy from the tiniest features to the very deepest features. So one of the other limitations of the traditional uh, ultrasound imaging technology is it's based on these piezoelectric crystals and they're very resonant and they tend to have a relatively narrow bandwidth. So when you wanna build an imager that works at one and a half megahertz to image something deep, you have to build your crystal with one shape and one set of properties. And when you wanna image something very shallow like nerves and, and superficial vessels, you need to build a crystal with a different type of resonant properties. And use this uh, silicon transducer technology is actually able to span this whole spectrum uh, with just one type of transducer. So you don't need to buy three different probes, one for high frequency or low frequency. This one device will get you the whole spectrum. And that was really the first of its kind. Um, we got our FDA clearance in about 2018, and it was uh, the largest array of applications that had ever been cleared for any ultrasound, uh, single ultrasound device on the market. Uh, but we knew that wasn't quite going to be the end of the story for us. So for our business, uh, we had the ultrasound on chip. That was the first piece of the puzzle to, to democratizing medical imaging, make it cheap and accessible and powerful. Uh, but we knew we needed other pieces to complete the puzzle. And so we built uh, a, a cloud platform so that people would have a place to store and share these images. Essentially, we could make it as easy to uh, share a study with a professional on the other side of the world as it is to post a family photo to social media. And we also needed to leverage uh, artificial intelligence to solve another piece of the puzzle, which is uh, why is it so hard to scan and interpret the images from an ultrasound? And all three of these pieces would come together to support each other to solve the problem in a complete way. So the first thing we, we started out uh, was with the cloud platform. It was just a place to store images because uh, an image that you can only see on the spot and you can't share with professionals that know how to interpret is, is not as useful. So uh, we made it as easy as a, for a big hospital or a single doctor practice to have a place to store all these images and share them across the world. And generalizing this to uh, the developing world, you could have someone who is uh, in site or on site in one of these rural villages. And as long as they have you know, a, a cellular connection, which is actually quite common in the developing world, uh, they would be able to share their findings with an expert in, in the US or in Europe to help make help them make a diagnosis and help the person in front of them. Uh, since then, it's expanded to a pretty comprehensive offering where we, we bring in all of the moving parts that it takes to uh, use imaging in a hospital setting. And we've made it as easy to deploy in a tiny practice as it is into a giant uh, multi-hospital network. And the other piece we built into this is, is we actually were able to uh, sh ship a telemedicine tool. So this is a way for someone to can take a non-expert user, someone who's never used ultrasound before, and they can receive remote guidance from, from a professional user in a very intuitive way. They can give instructions, they can actually control uh, the device gain and settings and really help them complete these procedures. And the reason this was important, particularly last year, is, is it turns out ultrasound is a very important tool for uh, monitoring the progression of COVID-19. You can watch uh, the, the health of the lungs by look, looking for these beelines that you see here, these certain types of uh, reflective structures. And you can actually predict from this 
whether the patient is going, you know, improving or declining you know, way before you could uh, through other means. And so we were able to get emergency clearance for this to, to deliver to our customers in uh, last year. Uh, finally, we've, we've invested a lot in education as well because we realized that uh, not everybody's an expert. It takes a bit of training. So we created a portal of, of hundreds of videos and other training materials to help people uh, who have never used ultrasound before uh, become proficient. And we provided stuff for complete novices, but also experts who just want to get more out of their, their device. And more long-term, we've also invested in medical schools. So uh, as an example, the University of California during their white coat ceremony where uh, incoming medical students traditionally received their first stethoscope as a symbol of them beginning their career in, in medicine, uh, University of California gave all of their students one of our devices uh, as sort of the stethoscope of the future. And I think this, this is going to be important, I believe, within the next five years. Um, it will be a core part of, of the curriculum of all medical students uh, to be skilled in using uh, imaging as, as a first line of diagnosis. Uh, but where it gets really interesting is when you think about what can we do if we have artificial intelligence uh, helping us solve this problem as well. So, so what if instead of a person at the other end of the line guiding you to the correct uh, image, what if we had uh, the deep learning algorithm that was actually helping you provide uh, feedback and getting you to the right place? And so this little video snippet I just showed you, this is, this is a, uh, a prototype. It's completely under research right now, but it is a real thing. This is uh, uh, you know, not a pre-made video. This is actually the, a real artificial intelligence al algorithm guiding people to find a good image of a heart. And at the other end of this, what if the AI could also help you interpret that image? So now you've got an image of a heart, but what does that mean? How, does, how do you know if the patient is healthy or unhealthy? And so another class of algorithms can actually take the image and run it through another uh, a network to try and extract some key features of health. So how efficiently is the heart uh, pumping blood into the body? Because that's often a very good indicator of whether a patient's condition is improving or, or worsening. And some of these algorithms are, are not just research, we are actually shipping them to customers today. And so one such algorithm is, a, is a automatic bladder volume measurement. So uh, I, I didn't mention, but uh, this ultrasound device is actually the only one of its kind that can do 3D imaging in a form factor like this. So if you wanna do 3D imaging, you really have to go to the large bulky ultrasound machines, uh, but we've been able to offer it with this device here. And so this, uh, what you're seeing right there is, is another application we are shipping to customers where you just help them put the probe in the right place over the bladder. They press a button and within a couple of seconds, they were able to use that 3D volume to automatically calculate the, the, the uh, volume of the urine in the bladder. And the reason that's important is a, is a lot of people, first of all, if you are had an operation recently or you're in the hospital bed, uh, a lot of times you're catheterized and uh, the nurses will actually go around bed to bed and they need to either using a timetable or more expensive bladder volume devices figure out when to catheterize which patients so that they don't overload the kidneys but you also don't want to do it too often because you increase the risk of infection and then uh, outside the hospital there's actually a large part of the population suffering from neurogenic bladder which means that they've uh, they don't have that neural connection to tell them when they need to uh, when they need to void so they need to self-catheterize and right now they do that on a timetable. And it's again, this balance of you wait too long, you can damage your kidneys, you do it too often, then you'll end up with, a, with an infection. And another one of the very interesting stories that have happened uh, and a kind of signal uh, ultrasound making its way closer to the patient and closer to the home. So this is this person, Dr. Tro, uh, he's a physician. He had just ordered his butterfly IQ and uh, within a couple of days of receiving it, he happened to have his father over at his, his daughter's birthday party and noticed that he was really not feeling well. He wasn't being himself. And so he decided to take him upstairs and scan his heart real quick. And he actually found um, a problem. It's called a Widowmaker uh, event because it's one of those things that can kill you in an instant if you let it go just even a couple of days too late. And he found it that same day on his first usage of his new ultrasound device and was able to literally save his father's life that day. And so uh, I believe over the next uh, you know, several years, 
um, medicine is going to be entering the home. It's going to be getting closer and closer to the patient. And I think inexpensive imaging is going to be one of the important pieces of, of getting uh, care closer to the home. And I'll close by talking um, a bit about some of the more global impact that we've had. So uh, the New York Times wrote a pretty wonderful article about us last year. It took the cover of the International New York Times. Uh, we gave some of our probes to an organization called Bridge to Health, and they took them to remote villages in Africa, and they used them to uh, both diagnose, look for pneumonia, but also diagnose growths and tumors that have been affecting people for a long time. And these people, you know, they, they, they would go to witch doctors or whatever it is in their area, to, and it was completely ineffective. And it was a huge change to their lives to be able to see you know, is this a uh, benign growth? Is it something more serious that you need to get uh, intervention with? Uh, and so I think that speaks really broadly to the, the global impact we're gonna be having. We actually have our devices being used by charities in about 46 low income countries around the world. And that number is gonna be steadily increasing. So that's the, uh, business overview. That's kind of the story of, of what is Butterfly? Why did we build this? How did we get here? And, and, and where are we going? And so now I'm going to uh, transition over to a fun, more technical discussion um, in case you guys want have some more questions about how exactly we built this and what goes into to pulling off something like this. Uh, we recently spoke at the International Solid State Circuit uh, conference. And so um, pretty much everything you see here, you hear, see here has been publicly discussed, at least in, in a technical forum like this. So if anybody attends ISCC, you might uh, recognize some of this. Uh, but as I mentioned, ultrasound has the capability to provide diagnostic value at pretty much every stage in life from before you're born until uh, the very last days of your life. Um, and the current state of ultrasound is really dominated by the limitations of the piezoelectric transducer technology they have. So uh, the, the long and short of it is when you need to image something very deep, you need low frequency ultrasound because it penetrates, it doesn't attenuate. But the trade-off is you get low resolution because that axial resolution is proportional to your wavelength and the lower frequencies have a coarser wavelength. And when you want to image very shallow, you go the opposite direction, you go a very high frequency uh, but the trade-off is that the signal at those high frequencies it drops off very quickly in the body, and so you can't image very deep. And so to really cover a whole spectrum of applications, you need usually at least three different probes uh, spanning the frequency range. And they're also fairly expensive. They've been getting cheaper. Um, there are other handheld ultrasound devices, so we're, we're not the only one out there. Uh, but if you look at what you need to, to get, you're leveraging their platforms to cover the whole span, it's still uh, fairly expensive. And so what we've done is we've taken these things which are typically physical properties of the material that you use to build the ultrasound device and we turn them into electronically tunable properties uh, of our chip device. So now we can electronically recreate all of these probes and cover the whole spectrum. And the key technologies that went into this are first and foremost uh, MEMS. So this is microelectromechanical systems. These are machines that are fabricated in a, in a semiconductor process, very much like we've made traditionally made electronics. And we've actually had experience, uh, everyone has had ex exposure to MEMS, even if they didn't know it. So uh, all of the accelerometers that are in our, our phones and our gyroscopes uh, and even our magnetometers are all MEMS devices, they're machines built on chips. And the, uh, one of the advantages in addition to being very, uh, cheap and scalable to manufacture is you get direct integration with the electronics. So now it's not this piece and then a package and a wire and another piece, you can actually get it all in one semiconductor chip substrate. Uh, the other key piece of this is a fairly sophisticated um, ASIC right behind these MEMS transducers and directly integrated with them. Uh, it's a high voltage mixed signal uh, ASIC has a very large channel count. So there's almost 9,000 elements that are all individually addressable on this array. And it's a very flexible system so that we can cover the whole uh, range of imaging different parts of the body. And this is kind of a high level overview. This is what the ultrasound chip looks like. This whole middle region is a 140 by 64 element array. 
Uh, we've broken it up into groups of eight elements in the analog front end and put uh, several hundred digital processing units at the bottom of each column uh, to pr provide our digital signal processing and interface to the rest of the world. Uh, here's another look of it. You can, this, this is actually a SEM uh, micrograph. So on the edge, you see our bond pads. You see our, our uh, processing circuitry taking up this area. And then over here, you start to see our, our micromechanical uh, transducers. Uh, a bit of an overview of what uh, capacitive micromachine ultrasonic transducers look like. Uh, it's basically a, a machined cavity on the top surface of a wafer. So you have a wafer substrate. You build a very tiny cavity. And the insight here is that when you have very small uh, distances, you can get extremely high magnetic or electric fields and therefore very high electrostatic forces. And so it's been realized since the, uh, the, the 90s that you could use this to build ultrasonic transducers. And it's a technology that's basically mostly been in the laboratory. And what we've been doing is trying to make it uh, a commercially viable thing. So it's reliable, it's manufacturable, it's low cost. And some of the advantages of this is it's the, the fabrication is obviously a huge advantage, but you can also very easily create arbitrary geometries from the tiniest three-dimensional arrays to the largest uh, one-dimensional arrays. And the way it works is you have a plate. Uh, you can think of it like a, a drum. You have the bottom of the drum and then you have the top surface of the drum. And what you do is you apply a static voltage to kind of give you a, a static operating point. And then you apply an AC voltage to uh, essentially pull the plate in a little bit further or release it more. And that motion gives you the transduction and the creation of ultrasound waves. And then the reciprocal of that, when the ultrasound waves come back, they push on the membrane. And because you have a static voltage there, uh, the capacitance of the structure is changing, which means that you actually have to be moving charge around. So you get a current when the ultrasound hits the wave and you hook that current up to an amplifier and that's how you get your, uh, your ultrasound signal chain. Uh, the basics of how imaging works is you, you have a phase where you transmit ultrasound. So you're in this transmit mode where you're pushing the thing, making it act like a speaker and that sends out the wave into the body. And then you, you switch into a receive mode and you listen to all the echoes coming back. And you do that multiple times with your beams pointed in different directions and use that to form an image. And so I'll start by talking about the, the front end part of that, the transmit and receive part, and then later talk about how that turns into an image. So this is a uh, the block diagram in our ISCC paper. And I'll kind of walk through this piece by piece so that we can look at uh, all the components that go into making an ultrasound signal. Uh, so at the front of this is the first is the transmit receive mechanism. So this uh, capacitor here represents the actual ultrasonic transducer. And first we have it hooked up to a high voltage driver that actually pushes the voltage up and down and causes the CMUT to change shape to make the waves. And we're protecting that from our sensitive receive electronics because the voltages are quite substantial. Uh, once we're in this receive mode, we turn off the, this pulser and we engage this switch and we hook it up to a transimpedance amplifier, which turns that current signal into a, an amplified voltage. And we, uh, we group these into units of eight just for design simplicity, and we combine them together uh, to uh, basically uh, allow us to, to cover the whole array. And one of the keys here is that uh, we can combine them uh, as they are, or we can uh, isolate them individually so that we can build a synthetic image of the whole aperture one by one based on whether we need that resolution in the wide dimension or whether uh, we don't need it. And that really just depends on imaging mode. So once it's combined, the first state is what's called a time gain. Uh, the next stage is a time gain control. So ultrasonic waves will actually attenuate exponentially in the body. And so in order to keep the signal level downstream relatively flat, we uh, apply an exponential gain on the signal so that we can flatten it out. And then it goes into an analog to digital converter. Um, and everything after that is fully digital. Uh, on the digital side, uh, we have a, a multitude of ADCs coming in all at 10 bits, uh, 25 to 50, 40 megahertz. And the first stage looks a lot like a, uh, a radio, uh, something you'd see in a radio system. It's a quadrature demodulator. It also looks a lot like the first thing you do to a, uh, the signal in a radio telescope as well. 
And what this is, is, is we know that this, the information in that signal is concentrated at a certain center frequency and a certain span. And so just like tuning to a particular radio station, you move that whole spectrum down to, to the center, turn it into a complex signal, and then you filter off all the stuff that you're not interested in. And then at this point, we do a little bit of micro beam forming. So we allow your, you to combine uh, channels that are locally uh, related, uh, also being able to apply small delays to them to focus them in particular directions like you would with a phased array. And then we store all of that data into a memory so that we can offload it um, later. And so once we're at this phase, we have a raw ultrasound signal. And the next stage is really about uh, turning that raw ultrasound signal into an image. So the, a, a bit of a basics of how ultrasound works is you, you, you have a certain region of the body or that you want to image. And what you do is you point ultrasound beams and you kind of create a fan-like uh, scanning pattern. First, you're looking in this direction and then you're steering in different directions and you're trying to form the whole image at the end of the day by looking at all these different directions. And for each one of these transmit events where you're look, pointing the beam in a certain direction, you get echoes off of these structures. Sometimes they're points, sometimes they're uh, more homogeneous tissue, but either way you get echoes back. And if you zoom in and, and for each one of these transmit directions, you, you ask what does that whole ultrasound array see when, for example, it's bouncing waves off of a point target in the middle of, of the uh, field. And this is pretty much what it looks like. So if you imagine this horizontal dimension right here is element position along your, your physical aperture, and this vertical dimension is time. So we have a, here a point scattering target, which is centered roughly here on the aperture. So the first person to receive this echo is this element that's sitting right here directly in the line of sight of that point target. And as you start to get more and more away from the line of sight, the echoes take a little bit longer to reach those elements. And so you get these hyperbolic arcs. And then you, you get a different set of arcs based on where you point the beam and they, they change shape slightly as well. So what we do is we, uh, for each one of these um, elements and each one of these points in the image that we want to reconstruct, we calculate how long it was going to take for that uh, transmitted ultrasound beam to reach the point and then subsequently, how long does it take the reflection echo to reach the specific element I'm looking at? And so it's just a little bit of you know, geometry to figure out what the time delay is. And that tells you where in this data you should be getting the information that's going to reconstruct a particular point in space. And so that first step is called uh, received beam forming. And what you're doing is you're taking a, a transmit look in a particular direction. You're mapping all of those delays so that you can reconstruct uh, what these observations mean for a particular point in space. And you get something uh, that looks like this. It's, it's basically a, a polar format representation of what each of these transmit directions uh, is, is reconstructing for a particular region of the image. Uh, the next piece of this is transmit, we call transmit beam forming. So we have uh, each transmit event has created, re reconstructed a section of the image. And then we have all these other sections and sometimes they overlap by a little bit. And so now you need to reshape and, re and delay these things, uh, each of these transmit events to form a complete image. And once you've done that, you, you have a, a polar format image. Now you need to remap it to rectangular coordinates so that you get a, a physical representation of what was being imaged. And after that, there's a whole bunch of what I like to call Photoshop being done on the image. So these are things like uh, doing envelope detection. So you can take this complex signal and turn it into a positive valued real signal. Uh, you use a, a logarithmic compression usually because there's a huge amount of dynamic range in these signals. So you, you usually want to logarithmically compress it so that you can see some of those very faint structures on top of those very bright structures. You do things like uh, speckle reduction algorithms. You do edge preserving filters so that you can smooth out some of the speckle and uh, bring out some of those anatomical features. And uh, technically this is a, a pretty substantial improvement on the state of the art in uh, integrating ultrasonic systems on a chip. Uh, so this was our ISCC uh, you know, comparison table. Uh, we built this on 130 nanometer BCD plus MEMS process. It is a very wide band cement that can cover ranges from one megahertz to 10 megahertz. 
uh, massive channel count, almost 9,000 individually addressable channels. And the pitch was kind of chosen to be at a sweet spot for a system that's going to act like a, a, a steered phased array for low frequencies and what we call a linear array for, for high frequencies. Uh, we also have a multi-level pulser, so it's not just a bang-bang pulser. We can actually um, have the pulser modulate at different uh, levels, which allows us to control the response of these MEMS more, more carefully. Uh, we have a very high resolution time gain comp compensation. Uh, we have over a thousand ADCs on the chip, so a very large amount of digital data. Uh, the, the marketing term is it's producing about 11 DVDs worth of data every single second. Um, and it's also very aggressively power efficient because we have 9,000 amplifiers and 1,000 ADCs that all need to run off of a battery and not burn your hand when you use it for more than a minute. Uh, so this is just another quick imaging showcase. Some of the uh, things that are interesting from ultrasound perspective is uh, vascular imaging. So uh, people use this to do needle sticks, to look for occlusions and thrombosis in veins. Um, another very common application that's unique to ultrasound is you can actually measure blood flow uh, through Doppler ultrasound. You can essentially look at the evolution, the phase shift as you image the same area multiple times. You can use that phase shift to infer the velocity of things in that field. Uh, we can look at uh, small anatomy, uh, like musculoskeletal is another big one. So when you uh, get a muscle tear, sometimes the first thing they do is send you to an MRI. Uh, but we're finding more and more that ultrasound can give you pretty much the same information as an MRI could as far as determining the extent of a muscle tear um, and other tissue damage. Uh, most people are probably only familiar with the obstetric use case. Uh, you know, you, you have a baby, you get the ultrasound. Uh, it turns out this is actually a, a, a it's, it's a large part of ultrasound scans, but it's by a long shot not the largest. The largest use case of ultrasound is actually in, in heart health and cardiac. Uh, because the heart is a moving structure, it's one of the only imaging modalities that's really suitable for imaging moving objects, and that's why it's so important for cardiac. Uh, and also importantly for, especially for COVID times, is lung imaging. So uh, it, it turns out the, the de facto standard for imaging the lungs is a chest x-ray where you try to look for dimming to try and infer if there's fluid in the lungs. Uh, but it turns out it's actually much more effective to look for these things called A-lines and B-lines, which are uh, image artifacts which occur when, when an ultrasound beam hits uh, little bubbles of fluids that are on the lung. They create these reverberations that create these uh, comet-like artifacts. They call them A-lines. And that's a very clear indication that there's fluid in the lungs. And you can essentially measure how much fluid by counting how many of these A-lines that you have. And so it's actually been shown to be much more effective than the de facto X-ray standard for diagnosing not just pneumonia, but particularly the, the kind of fluid that builds up uh, during COVID-19 infection. Um, this is uh, another quick demo of that. Uh, one of those uh, artificial intelligence applications I talked about. So this is measuring what's called an ejection fraction. So this is a, a quantity that basically measures, you know, when your heart is going between these systolic and diastolic phases, it's pumping blood. And you can actually estimate the volume of the heart in these two states. And that gives you an, uh, an estimate of how effectively the heart is actually moving blood around the body. So that's called an ejection fraction. And a, you know, a healthy person has an ejection fraction of at least 55%, 55 to 65% of the blood is leaving the left ventricle on every beat. Uh, but when it drops below that, that's a very strong indication that the, the patient is taking a turn for the worst. And it's usually it, it's preceding other signs that you might have like shortness of breath or being lethargic. The, the, the ejection fraction is usually a first sign before it gets to that point. And so it's a very good uh, metric. Uh, so, so that's going to be the, the end of my talk about the business and also about the technology. And so I think now is a good time to, to switch over to, to questions and discussion. All right.